how to choose yarn for knitting. Hi everyone, my name is Norman and today's video is all about choosing the right yarn for your next knitting project. Which material should you pick, which yarn weight, which needle size and of course how to choose color combinations. This topic has been requested by so many of you and it seems that finding the best yarn for a pattern is a major problem for many knitters. And if you are one of them, this video will show you all the little tips and secret tricks you need to know to knit satisfying projects that spell wow with every stitch. So let's dive right into it, but before, please do me a favor and comment with a yarn pattern combination from one of your previous projects that you thought was either the perfect match or an epic failure. Step one how to choose color combinations. One of the biggest problems that many knitters have is finding color combinations. No matter if you're knitting simple stripes, fair isle or advanced intaja projects, just how do you choose yarn colors that match and look harmonic? Well, I could be talking an hour about color theory and color wheels like this one, but, you know, we're not living in an age of Isaac Newton anymore and I feel that is a bit old-fashioned. Because there may not be an ointment for it, but there certainly is an app and I am typically using Canva. Now, I have to stress that I'm not affiliated with them and neither is this a knitting app. But they have this super easy and smart color wheel and you know, if you can use Microsoft Excel to chart a pattern, why not use a web designer tool for planning your Fair Isle sweater? So, what you can do with an app like this is, you can pick any color here on the color wheel and it will instantly show you a nice contrasting tone. So, pick a color that roughly looks like the yarn you have in mind and then it will provide you with a nice contrasting color. In this case, this red seems to go well together with this blue. Or, Maybe we want to use this light green here. So then the app tells us uh, this purple yarn here would create a super nice contrast. Now there are also so-called triadic colors. So you can change the setting here and then it will show you three harmonizing colors. And these can add quite a bit of exciting drama to your knitting. So again, you pick one color and then it will automatically show you three colors that go well together. Now you might go, well, Norman, this here doesn't actually look very promising, but there are a couple of further things to consider. The first thing we need to talk about is shades, tones and tints. So this color combination looks a bit meh if you ask me, way too bold. But if we drag this circle to the center, then these toned down colors are suddenly looking much better. And then you can toy around with the brightness and maybe go for a more well pastel kind of view or add some bold strength to it. And suddenly we have a color combination that could work very well together. And the way you should approach this is that you pick one main color and then you use the other two colors as support. So maybe 60% of the main color, then 30% of the second color and the third color you only use 10% of the time as a little contrast in between. And then you can also introduce a neutral background color. So maybe gray in this case. And then you can use these three colors for the yoke of the sweater and this here for the body and you have a beautiful Fair Isle sweater planned out for you. Now there are many apps that do basically exactly the same. The keyword you are looking for is color wheel. I just happen to like this one here because it's very easy to use as a non-web designer. It's for free and doesn't come with a lot of ads. And you can bring your phone or tablet to your local yarn shop and then just toy around and look, well, what's looking nice? Maybe this tone, maybe this, and just toy around until you found something you like. Step number two, pick a material. 
So let's suppose you want to substitute a yarn for a pattern either because it's not available or because it's too expensive or you want to start designing your own pattern from scratch. Well, then your very first step should always be finding the right material. Before you care about the colors, you should settle on a material you need or want to knit with. And to be quite frank, a lot of knitters do it the other way around. They look for a nice colorway, buy it, and then they look for patterns to knit with it. And, well, I don't know if that is the best approach. Now, there are quite a couple of books out there for knitters that cover yarn properties and yarn materials, like uh, The Knitter's Book of Yarn by Clara Parks. Uh, and I feel that is always a good investment. I'll put a link in the description below. Still, let's cover the basics together. As knitters, we have three general kinds of yarn available to us. First, protein-based fibers like sheep wool or alpaca that have been obtained by sharing animals. Then, plant-based fibers such as cotton or linen that have been harvested or extracted from plants. And of course, artificial, purely man-made fibers such as nylon or acrylic. Protein-based fibers are typically very warm, breathable, very soft, quite stretchy, but they will also felt and peel and are not machine washable. Plant-based fibers are usually not all that warm, not all that soft, usually machine washable. Some of them have a really, really nice stitch definition. Typically they can absorb a lot of water and usually they are not stretchy at all. And artificial fibers, well, they are typically inexpensive. Most of them are quite soft, in fact. They are typically machine washable, often near indestructible, but not very breathable. And sometimes they don't have the highest comfort factor. And depending on your preferences and the project you have in mind, one or the other will be more suitable. To help you along, I prepared a little questionnaire with five questions so you can find the best yarn for you and your next project. And just to get this straight, the following little questionnaire applies no matter if you are looking for the best yarn for a project or you are trying to substitute a yarn. Because if you want to do that, you still have to analyze the yarn the designer was using very carefully and then find a yarn with similar properties. So let's go through all these properties together. Question number one, how durable does your yarn need to be? Are you planning to knit socks, a lace shawl, a sweater, a hat, or maybe only some home decor? And depending on that decision, you need to pick a fiber that is durable enough to support the intended use. As a result, knitting socks like this one here uh, using 100% untreated sheep wool is typically not a good idea. You need a stable base that, that won't fall apart here, especially at the heels. So for example, you need nylon or acrylic. But at the same time, you want them to be breathable and absorb a little bit of water because eventually you will sweat in those thick winter boots. And that's why you will typically go for a nylon sheep wool blend when you knit socks. Best of both worlds. A sweater, on the other hand, like this one here, doesn't need to withstand all that much wear and tear, maybe a bit more here around the armpits. And that's why going for a pure sheep wool yarn, or as in this case, yak yarn, or maybe even cashmere can be a great choice. And your average lace shawl is basically just decoration. So if you're careful when wearing it, you can use even the most delicate yarns. Now, I hope you understand that I can only give you a couple of examples here. This topic is complex, but it really pays off to do some research on the general properties of the different kinds of materials. On my blog, I have quite some resources on more exotic fibers, like yak, alpaca, camel hair, vicuña, and that kind of fibers. I'll add links to the description below. 
And as I said, if you are knitting a pattern and the designer is using a sheep wool nylon blend for their socks, it's probably a good idea to look for something similar and not go for a pure cashmere yarn or linen. Question number two, warmth and breathability. The second question you need to ask yourself is, how warm and how breathable does your project need to be? For example, Kivit, the luxurious fiber obtained from the musk ox. It's terribly soft and terribly expensive, but also very warm because these soft downs create millions of little air pockets that will keep you warm. Other protein fibers behave pretty much the same, but maybe not as extreme as Kivit. This can be a pro or a con. If you're living in Greenland, that's what you need. Now, setting the price aside, a Kivit sweater might not be a good choice for what people in Florida call winter. In that case, a light cotton or linen sweater might be the much better choice. Water absorption is also an important topic. If you sweat a bit more and if you typically feel warm more often than cold, knitting a sweater with acrylic yarn will be a poor choice because unlike sheep wool it cannot absorb up to 30% of its weight in water so that sweater will quickly feel like a finished sauna because all that moisture gets trapped underneath. Or maybe you want to knit a towel or a coaster then acrylic yarn will probably be an equally poor choice but for a nice pillow or some wall decorations or uh, tables like placemats, it could be exactly what you are looking for. The third question you have to ask is how fuzzy or smooth the yarn should be. For example, if you want to knit cables or Bavarian twisted stitches, as in this case, you want to use a fiber that has a nice stitch definition and maybe not use fuzzy mohair or cashmere yarn, where you won't be able to see anything of the complexities you added to your knitting. But when you're knitting simple lace or for example this nice little hat in plain stockinette stitch, these kinds of fibers might be able to add a little something extra to an otherwise plain pattern. And of course the same applies to speckles and colorways. If you have a busy pattern you typically don't want to distract from it by using an even busier yarn. Except, well, maybe when you are knitting a Stephen Best design. Question number four, stretchiness. Another very important question is the stretchiness of a fiber. Some fibers are super stretchy and have a lot of drape. Alpaca yarn, for example. Typically, the fabric grows quite a lot after the first wash and it left many knitters frustrated because their sweater came off the needles as a size L and fit perfectly and out of the washing machine as an X. Cotton or linen are typically not stretchy at all and that can make knitting with them quite difficult. But they do often change size dramatically after the first wash as well, while sheep wool will almost always bounce back and you can even re-block it if you treat things gently. So that's another thing you need to consider when choosing yarn for knitting and of course whenever you knit a swatch. I'll link you to my full tutorial on how to knit a swatch the right way up in here so you can avoid these kind of unexpected surprises the next time. And the last consideration is of course, does my finished project need to be machine washable? Most animal based fibers are hand wash only and maybe you don't want to knit baby and children's garments that shouldn't even come close to a washing machine. Cotton or superwash fibers are much better and will help to keep a mother sane. Socks, for example, also should see, probably see a washing machine ever so often, at least in my opinion. While for a shawl it really doesn't matter, you will maybe wash it once a season. And a merino sweater, if you wear it carefully and air it out ever so often, it doesn't need to be washed after every wear either. Still, it is very important 
to check the care instructions of a yarn before you start the project. Oh, and very important, if it's going to be a gift, always, period, always pick something machine washable. You can't imagine how often I heard horror stories uh, of someone knitting, you know, a big afghan or blanket and then they threw it into the washing machine and it came out as a, well, felted rag. Step three, find the right yarn weight. After you decided on a material, you have to find the right yarn weight. You can knit socks with lace yarn or worsted weight yarn or the gloves I knitted for my last video. You can do them with DK or lace yarn. So here are five important considerations concerning yarn weight and needle size. First, the heavier your yarn, the faster you will be able to finish. I needed maybe six hours for one glove in decay weight and almost twice as much for the lace weight option. After all, a smaller stitch will typically take just as much time as a stitch knitted with a much chunkier yarn. But you need so many more stitches with a finer quality. Using chunky yarn also means more warmth. This can be a pro or a con. Maybe you want something warm, maybe you don't. But please don't pick a chunky yarn just because you want to finish fast. Pick it because you need a sweater that is super warm. These chunky uh, single ply uh, yarns seem to be very popular for sweaters these days, especially among beginners. But personally, I wouldn't want to wear a sweater that is that warm. For a scarf like this one here, it's okay. And even then, I can only wear it on a super cold day. Next, a thinner yarn will have more drape. When you're knitting a tunic or a big shawl, you don't want to end up with a thick fabric because then you won't be able to drape it around your body as nicely and it won't look as delicate either. Then, the thinner the yarn, the more stitches per inch you will have and this can be quite important when it comes to lace knitting or fair art. Think of it as pixels on a TV screen. You need a certain kind of resolution to display certain details. For example, if you want to knit a little square with fair aisle, you need at least three by three stitches. And if you want to knit a circle, you probably need even five by five stitches. But if your uh, row only has 10 stitches, that, that can be very difficult to squeeze in. And then of course you will need less yarn by weight if you knit with a finer quality and it can be a bit cheaper. So for example these super chunky sweaters often cost 200 or 300 US dollar simply because it's 3 or 4 pounds of raw wool instead of just 350 grams for a similar sweater in a fingering weight. Step 4. Understanding ply and why it matters. The last and often totally overlooked topic is spinning theory. As knitters, so often we go to a yarn shop, see a nice color and it seems to be the right weight as well and then we buy it. But before you put that beautiful skein in your shopping cart, you might want to check out how it was spun. Why? Because it will have a huge influence on the overall appearance of your fabric. This is another very complex topic that probably deserves its own video and maybe a seasoned spinner to explain the finer details, which I'm sadly not. Still, there are two popular ways to spin yarn, worsted and woolen spun. And even if you don't care about the rest, you should definitely learn about these two types. Before a thread can be spun, the fibers need to be prepared. And you can either cart them or comb them. And the result will be fibers ready to be drafted that are either just blended together, that's woolen spun, or where the individual hairs are aligned perfectly, that's worsted spun. A worsted spun yarn will be very smooth, will have more drape and typically an excellent stitch definition. It will also be more resilient but also more condensed. In a woolen spun yarn, the individual hairs all stick out this way and that way. It will create a very lofty thread for warm garments. It's often very soft but the resulting fabric will often bloom a bit and it will not have the perfect stitch definition. 
It can be perfect for fair isle sweaters, but maybe not for a cable sweater. How can you tell them apart? Well, typically you will see this at first glance. If it is a very compact thread or is it something lofty? And when you pick the plies apart, it will often be even more apparent because one will be very smooth and regular and the other might even have little fluffs here and there. Now, obviously, this will depend a bit on the overall material. Mohair, even when worsted spun, will still be a hot mess under magnification. And in that context, you also need to understand ply. You can have single ply, four ply, eight ply, and so much in between. And the way you need to think of this is, the higher the ply, the more durable the yarn is. Let's imagine you have four strands of hair and you stack them upon each other. It will be very easy to pull them apart. Nothing is holding them together. That is roving. Now create two stacks and twist them together. And now it will be somewhat harder. That's two ply. And now twist always two of them together and then twist the resulting threads together one more time. And it will be become much harder to undo it. That's your average four ply. So if you want something durable, Typically, you will want to go for four or eight ply yarns. This can be important for socks, but also for lace, where the thread is so delicate that you need to get the maximum durability out of those few hairs so it doesn't fall apart, especially when you use a softer fiber with a short staple length. On the negative side, this adds twist to the yarn. Now, that is of course the intention, but the thing is that it's very difficult to create an utterly balanced yarn, especially as your knitting technique and the way you wind and unwind a ball even adds more twist. I'll link you to my full tutorial on knitting needle ribbings up in here, where I talk about this topic quite a bit. Either way, I'm sure you have observed how a highly twisted yarn often creates a stock in its stitch fabric where you can't see those V's anymore, but it more looks like, I don't know, check marks and you have this one continuous line. That's because this particular yarn and your individual knitting technique unbalance the thread and one leg is rolling to the inside and one to the outside. And depending on whether it is a set or an S spin, it can also be the other leg and sometimes because it's a three or a five ply. The bad news is that it is almost impossible to exactly predict this kind of behavior as too many factors play a role. So your main takeaway is that the ply can influence the overall appearance of your fabric. And it may mean that your stitches roll out roll in, stay put, or twist in every direction. And for certain projects like cables or lace, this kind of behavior is essential for the success or failure of a fabric. And in these cases, it, it always pays off to knit a complex swatch and not just plain stock in its stitch. Because I tried to find a common denominator here, but there are scant few factors because no two spinners and no two knitters are alike. Sure, knitting lace with a single ply or a three ply yarn often leads to less uniform results. And it's often those overspun yarns, so eight ply and very twisted, that um, lead to this kind of weird stockinette stitch, de stitch definition. And the single ply yarns often do whatever they want. But what happens in between single and eight ply? Well, that is typically much more difficult to predict. And it also depends a bit on the fiber, if it has a very short staple length, a lot of crimp, if it felt well or doesn't. And of course, this might mean that certain plying techniques are simply not viable and you have to use whatever is available in these cases. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't talk about yarn substitution at all. Isn't this the most important question here? Well, actually, I have been talking about it the whole time. If you want a similar outcome, then you have to check. Okay. 
What material did the designer use? Is it worsted or woolen spun? Is it a four ply or an eight ply? Which yarn weight is it? And then with these details, you can go shopping for any other yarn that ticks off all these checks and hopefully has a similar yardage. You will end up having to knit a swatch because even if it's a sheep wool four ply woolen spun yarn uh, with the same yardage, you, it still can be a bit loftier resulting in a slightly different gauge. And then you have to go down a needle size or knit one size smaller. In essence, I'm saying yarn substitution only becomes possible if you understand the yarn and I hope this video was able to help you along. At the end of the day, it's very important to realize that all these things I mentioned are nice considerations, but of course, uh, you kind of have to work with whatever is available to you. If you go to your local yarn shop, then there are not an unlimited numbers, uh, number of colors available, and these will not be available in each and every material either. And on top of that, some of them might be a bit too uh, pricey for you. So so you will have to make a compromise along the way. And I guess that is why knitting a swatch is so important. It's not only about getting gauge and planning the size of your project. It is also about seeing how the yarn truly behaves in a knitted fabric. And there's nothing wrong with admitting, well, this yarn and this pattern just don't seem to go together. Unravel what you have knitted so far maybe wash it once to get rid of the crimp and then use it for another project. Either way, I hope I was able to show you how to find the best yarn for your project. Please like this video if you enjoyed watching, comment with your feedback and your questions, and of course, don't forget to subscribe in case you don't want to miss any new videos. Happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.